batches, how many batches do you want, and what's the size of those batches. So we can adjust this to get better tuning based on the environment that you're in. And we also added the option to retry on locked files. So even if these files are locked, we can still retry on them and go back and try and copy them. But in this case, we're going to retry five times by default, and then after 30 minutes, we'll try again. So this will allow us to hopefully catch any of those open files that we didn't when we initially kicked off this job. Now, we also have compression options. Just as NTFS supports compression, so do we. We can choose to never compress the target files, always compress the target files, compress the target files only if the source is compressed. So we give you flexible options for that. As I mentioned in the introduction, we have the ability to migrate file shares to the destination server. This is a very interesting issue that comes up with data migrations. You have a lot of file shares, but it's almost impossible to figure out where they are, map them to the new locations, recreate the shares, and not have any downtime. Well, what we've done here is provided a mechanism to migrate those file shares with several different options. If the shares already exist, we can skip them. We can overwrite them, basically removing the old share and creating a new one. This would be great if you're copying within the same um, server or within the same cluster. We also can add a prefix or a suffix, and we give an option for a cluster group name. As I said earlier, this fully supports clustering services. So we can create the resource group for you, or if it already exists and you put in a name for an existing resource group, we will go ahead and add it as file shares to that. Then one of the most interesting features of Secure Copy is the ability to migrate local groups. Migrating local groups allows us to migrate local groups and users over that typically would have access to the data. So if any of us followed the Microsoft prescribed AGLP method, taking accounts and putting them within global groups, global groups within local groups, local groups having permissions, this becomes a big problem because there's no access to that local SAM database. So what we can do here is migrate those local groups and users. If we have local groups, we can set a password for them, uh, for those local users. And also, when our local group destination is specified, we can copy to the target server. We can move them into Active Directory as domain local groups. Or we can move them into the NT domain that you're using as part of the shared SAM database for them. We can choose to always perform the action of adding a prefix or a suffix. So if we wanted to know these are migrated groups, we could change their naming convention to indicate as such. And then we have options of what to do if the local group or username already exists. We can use this existing user group name. We can add members from the source group to this existing group. We can synchronize the target members with the source members. We can also add the prefix or the suffix that we want. Then we have another option to select how built-in groups are to be treated. Typically, we would not want to append the members of the target server's built-in groups, meaning if someone was an administrator on one server, we wouldn't necessarily want them to be part of that on the other server when we migrated over if there were local groups and users that were members of the local admins group. Then, of course, we also have a map file, which allows us to map user and group names from one server to user and group names from another server. Uh, for instance, things like the IIS accounts. They are going to be named based on the server, so this allows us to migrate and copy over that way. Then last and certainly not least, we can filter files. We can choose to include or exclude files of a certain extension. We can exclude folders of a certain name, for instance, temp temporary files or temporary internet files, or for our files here for filtering them, removing temporary files or removing uh, Windows Media files or MP3s that might be resident on your file servers. Then we can choose to include files modified between dates. So this can be used also exclusionarily everything older than a certain date, or everything newer than a certain date, or everything between a certain date you can use. We can limit how deep we want to go into the folder using recursion, and then to only include files between certain sizes. So these different options will round out what we can select for our available copy options in Secure Copy. The whole time we're migrating data, migrating security, migrating the file shares with their security, and have the ability to migrate local groups and users. So whenever I create these jobs, I can save them. And when I add a save job, so let's go ahead and save this job, and I'll give it a name. And I'll call this data migration. I'm going to hit OK. It's going to place this in my save jobs. And from here, I can actually schedule the job. I can run the job interactively. I can test the job, or I can even disable or enable the job. So this is going to provide us with the ability to schedule this and place it directly out to the Windows Task Scheduler service for use with this. So you can actually run these jobs after hours when no one's around. 
So secure copy is going to be a very viable solution for migrating all of your data. What secure copy also provides us is the ability to support certain third-party network attached storage devices, storage area networks. Also provides us with the ability to get data off of legacy platforms. So let's say we want to move from Windows NT to Windows 2000 or Windows Server 2003, we can do so with this. Or even for consolidation between platforms or within the same platform. Secure copy is going to be your single solution for migrating all of your data with the permissions intact and allowing you to simply do this after hours without impacting your users.